On today's Locked on Thunder podcast, SGA is set to return against Sacramento. Plus, how will the standing shuffle shake out in the final four games? You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and inside the Thunder beat writer, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunder Pod. And on today's show, we're talking about SGA getting set to return and how will the standing shake out with Oklahoma and beat writer Joel Lorenzi. Joel, how are you doing today? was cracking bro i had more energy the first couple times we did this but i'm still happy to be here as always my guy well hopefully you can get an energy boost uh here in a couple of minutes but today's show is brought to you by linkedin jobs linkedin jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster post your draft for free at linkedin.com slash locked in mba that's linkedin.com slash locked in mba post your draft for free terms and conditions do apply joel Hopefully your internet lasts longer than two minutes, but oh, I know, on my internet now. Okay. lasting that long might not be your strong suit, but Joel, how were you <laughs> on the road trip uh, with this team? What was it like seeing SGA? I mean, he missed six of the last seven games for the Thunder. Uh, what was that like for you being a part of that? And what did you think of that span? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it probably should have been seven to seven. Right. Um, but, but I mean, like, let's be honest, like the world wasn't falling. Um, like I think some people made it out to be, but at the same time, like obviously the basketball looked much different without, you know, not just Shea, but like Dub, two, two largely important creators who have been pivotal to this thing that now where the division of this team has changed rapidly, the expectations for the team has changed rapidly, mostly because Shea's look like an MVP and Dub is look like a top 30-ish, top 40-ish rising star. Um, very important to a creator. Um, I mean, their creation, this team runs off, um, you know, fast break opportunities and the advantages that these two dudes create, uh, whether it's just them being there or them with the ball in their hands. Like so much of what they do involves that or them bouncing off of each other, any anything of the short. And so without them, I mean, with one, with, with one, you could probably survive. I mean, we saw it in the Phoenix game with, with Doug, but without two, which we hadn't seen, it was ugly. It was ugly. I mean, the offense, they had to try different things from what I understood. They didn't really have any days in between most of that trip to kind of rehearse some of the advantages they were going to have to create without two guys that are that important. Um, And so a lot of it was like, you know, fishing for backdoors at the end of a shot clock, you know, fishing for like more connective advantages than, well, you know, the advantage that they had. They, I mean, let's say they had, I don't know, at least 10 advantages of the game off Shea just being who he is, getting downhill alone, like drawing a defense that way. So they had to make up for all that. And we're seeing like Point Dort and Point Kaysen and uh, Chet trying to create more off the dribble than he's ever had to. Um, a lot of it was rough. Um, but but they they made it work in, in Charlotte to a degree, and they, they got to win um, and, and save themselves from, I think, some level of embarrassment got themselves some breathing room for the Shea return now, which I think they're firmly in place to for a top three seed. I don't think the Clippers can catch them now. But in any case, Shea will be back and um, he'll have time to shake the rest off. Yeah, I think that I think that when you look at the Thunder, obviously the win against Charlotte snaps their first three game losing streak of the year. Uh, it clinches them home court advantage. They won't finish lower than four uh, at this point. And uh, it was just good to see the Thunder obviously get back on the winning side for them after losing three in a row. But without Shea and Jada, like there should have been no mystery what that would look like. Like this team without their top two guys is similar to all other 29 teams in the NBA without their top two guys. Like you take yeah. away and beat in Maxi, you take away, uh, you know, KD and Booker, you take away whoever you want to list off Kyrie and Luca. They're going to be a dramatically different team that loses a lot more than they win. Uh, that's the case for everybody. And it was the case for the thunder and will remain the case uh, for the thunder. Like that's why you uh, rest Shea in six of the seven games. Even if you lose, you only go on your first three game losing streak. Uh, this team, none of this season matters in the sense of, uh, one seed, two seed, three seed, blue seed. If you don't have SGA 
playing as close to 100% as he possibly can be playing uh, in the postseason. And you mentioned, you know, getting to return him at home tomorrow against Sacramento and what that does for this team, both on the court, obviously will make life a lot easier. You're getting an MVP candidate back. But for him specifically, uh, you're allowing him to not just go into the postseason cold. Now, I'm, I'm curious how you would balance, if you were Mark, how you would balance Shea on this back-to-back, the last back-to-back of the year, uh, and they're all four games are at home, and you have that week off coming up, though, next week, heading into game one. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and for what it's worth, I think it's important to note the context of that seven-game stretch, what happened in it, um, maybe any miscommunication that we'll never know, never come to understand. But, like, people know by now, like, he shouldn't. He probably shouldn't have played that New York game. He said he felt good to start the game or the day of the game. Mark, you know, said the same thing, agreed. I, If I had to guess, I think Shea gave them the thumbs up that he was good to go. He quickly realized that was not the case. He probably could have used another couple games. I don't know the severity of whatever – you know, the, the, the quad contusion. Um, but clearly, I, I think he could have used those an extra couple of games. I don't think he was – I mean, obviously, now that he hit the game winner, it's there's some revisionist history, but I don't think they should have used him or maybe they wouldn't have even needed him in that New York game. I don't know. It's it's just – it's 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 in the past now. Um, I do think because he, he seemed to have a different bounce, different energy to him. Um, at the TD Garden when they went to Boston, like he could make a return, like he could play then and there, um, which was two games later. Um, I just think the when they sent him home, it was just a precautionary thing, you know, to to make sure they had the staff around him, to make sure they could have him in the gym whenever, how, however much they wanted him to be, because Mark mentioned it, you know, on the road, that kind of thing is tougher, just in terms of gym access, facility access. You got him in your facilities when you send him back here, and so. Um, I think looking back, I don't know if Shea will ever admit this. There was probably some malpractice there in his judgment, his part in terms of playing, or maybe it was just a freak. I don't know. Maybe it was just it was that much of a, a freak accident that you know he got hurt again. Um, there, I, I don't know. Maybe he got rushed back. He he didn't seem to feel that way. Uh, Mark didn't seem to give that indication. It's just uh, you know speculation on my part. But uh, regardless, and, and now, just to clarify, I think that like there also can be. Uh an element of, since it is a contusion, like there can be an element of maybe he did feel good Sunday and, and it yeah, looked, yeah. it looked positive, but yeah. you, you get hit and one time on a drive. Realize, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. get hit on a drive one time on your quad and all of a sudden now you don't feel the way you felt at noon uh, whenever the game tips off at six. So like, I think that there's an element of uh, this is of all injuries. This is an injury where it's a little tougher to predict. Right. And so um, I just think him being sent home, gave him the, the, the time span a few days uh, to be precautionary to to not though I I don't think they needed to, they clearly won without him in in Charlotte without him or Dub so I I think it was a precautionary thing to make sure there wasn't a repeat of whatever happened in New York um, and now I think they had the freedom where four games is more than enough time I think to shake any possible rust if that's gonna exist after seven games um, well six in his case but um, it's enough time I think. With with Dub being questionable and he's been going through you know pregame stuff now, um, he's been moving better. He's dealt with a bunch of ankle sprains as is this year. Um, I think Dub is progressing toward a return. It seems based on you know his upgraded statuses and, and whatnot. So I imagine with one of them, if their plan is to not lose out or struggle the way they did on this past trip, the, the rest of these games, um, I imagine just having Dub on on. What is that? Wednesday for the Spurs game would be fine. Maybe you rest shade in. Um, you play him tomorrow if he's, you know, that excited to play. Um, it's still a game where I think both team starters would be playing. Obviously, the, the Kings are, you know, still fighting for position. I do think uh I don't know. I don't know how Bucks how much the Bucks care about position at this point. That by the way, and we talked about this, that when you a snapshot of the Eastern Conference standings looks insane right now. But um, but then you got the Dallas game, which I don't know what Dallas would have locked up Biden if they'll have locked up that fifth seed or if they'll still be going back and forth with, with L.A., what their goal is there. Um, it also depends on what the Thunder's goal is there. The Thunder could very well trot out 
anybody. They could try out any lineup that day in, in, in the case that, you know, they've locked up the third seed and that's their only reality. It's too hard to tell. Usually these, these types of games at the end of the year are like for, for reserves, right? But there's like a lot of implications now. I don't know. It, it depends on each side. There are a lot of implications. We'll talk about that standing shuffle coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now about our good friends over at LinkedIn. Check out LinkedIn right now because they are there for you uh, to help you make hires for your small business. And if you want to find qualified professionals uh, that are right for their role, you can go check them out today at LinkedIn Jobs. That's LinkedIn Jobs to help you give the tools to get the right professionals uh, for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn is not just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place uh, to hire. It gives you access to professionals that you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy uh, when you uh, go and get qualified candidates at LinkedIn. Uh, check them out today uh, at LinkedIn Jobs uh, to get 86% of small businesses and qualified candidates in 24 hours. LinkedIn helps you get your small businesses and helps you whenever you're wearing so many hats. Uh, and, you know, they give you the resource to hire and branch out. So go there right now with 2.5 million small businesses uh, using LinkedIn for hiring. You can do it too by posting your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked in MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked in MBA. Terms and conditions do apply. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Folks, we're here with Joe Lorenzi, the Oklahoman beat writer at JX Lorenzi on Twitter to discuss the Thunder's last home, uh, last home state of the season, recap their last road trip of the regular season, and how the standings will shake out. But just to put a bow on uh, the road trip, obviously this team looks totally different without Shea. Uh, this team uh, is is built around having SG and Jada, just as every team is, around having their top two guys. Uh, but what did you see from this road trip that was either encouraging, discouraged? What did you evaluate from this road trip in general that you can take away even without having SGA? Yeah, I mean, I, I took it with a grain of salt just because it wasn't just SGA, but it was Dub. Um, obviously, like we talked about a bunch. Um, it's just going to be a different complexion of a team. Um, I thought some of the on-ball looks for Cason were encouraging, especially earlier in a road trip, just some of the off-dribble midi pull-ups he, he had to get to. Um, I thought some of that stuff was encouraging. I, I thought we could have maybe saw more of that, which I don't know that that was his choice. I, th I thought Wiggins um, – I, I, I caught the, the Charlotte game in spurts. I, I'm, I still got to watch that film back. But I thought from what I saw from, from Aaron Wiggins was encouraging. Just obviously um, – you know, who he is, his identity, um, what he could bring. Obviously, that, that'll be scaled down in a, a playoff setting. But um, I think that just that uh, that affirmed that uh, uh, a lot of thoughts a lot of Thunder fans have on him and just um, what he could bring as a, a ninth man or whatever, just in the rotation period. Uh, I don't know that I would say anything was discouraging beyond uh, – beyond what we already talked about, just how different they look. Um, that's not necessarily discouraging. That's just their reality. Um, I do. I mean, obviously, like Gordon Hayward continues to be like a, a questionable uh, fit for the, the playoff rotation, like whether he's ready for that, whether these, these uh, sample of games was enough time for him to get acclimated, uh, whether he's still battling, you know, that internal, um, that internal, just awareness of, you know, is this my spot? Is this my spot? When to pick them? Um, or if, you know, I don't know, there are a bunch of factors that, that might be contributing to it, but, you know, whether he'll be actually viable for, you know, the, the playoff rotation is, is a, is a question that people have been asking since he really got here. I wanted to wait for a long enough sample. And I thought um, with dub out, with Shea out, like that was a prime opportunity to maybe show some of the pop uh, that people were hoping for show, you know, glimpses of Charlotte Gordon Hayward, which was never going to be the case. I don't think here because he played 30 minutes over there, but I think it was relatively discouraging that um, he still looked like the same player. Um, so, yeah, I think though Gordon Hayward, that is the only thing you can take away from this road trip in a, in a true evaluation sense of just against Boston going over four, you know, just not shooting without Shay and Jada did raise some concerns uh, had a whole podcast about that. You can go back and check out uh, an article, of course, on inside the thunder.com and you're going to have one as well uh, that they can check out uh, for you, Joel. But 
the positive aspects, I think, far outweighed the, the negative aspects in the sense of we knew the record would not be good without Shea and Jada. You took on the best team in the NBA. You took on a team that uh, is one of the fastest in the NBA to exploit your lack of depth because when we talk about the offense that they lose, that's two very impactful defenders that they lose. And against Indiana, you lost seven bodies against Indiana because you had seven with the G League. You had J-Dub and Shea out. You had Gordon Hayward leave early. Seven bodies against the fastest team in the NBA. Of course, you're going to let go of the rope down the stretch of that game. So the, that that was not something that I was overly concerned about. Uh, the, the Philadelphia game, if you tell me, and I know how it ended, I know that you had a chance at the end, but if you tell me that without Shea and J-Dub, you're going to go in against him, beat in, in, in the Sixers and have a shot to win late, uh, you're going to take that. Obviously, they didn't have their closers, though. Uh, yeah. you, were, were we going to act surprised that Josh Giddy uh, and, and Chet Holmgren struggled to close out Philadelphia on the road? I'm yeah. not, because if we are surprised by that, why? Because who are you going to want to close out the games tomorrow whenever Shea is back? Who do you want to close out the games in two weeks when the playoffs start? It's not going to be Chet and Josh. No offense to them. It's going to be SGA and J-Dub. So the fact that they struggled to close games against Philadelphia and they let go of the rope against Indiana and, and they had to you know, scratch and claw at the end of Charlotte – is not all that surprising. And, and so I think that the positives were, were way overwhelming compared to the negatives, despite their record. And one of those positives was Josh Kitty. Like I really am bought into this version of Josh Kitty because I think that the way that he's having success, it's not like he did against Milwaukee. It's not like he did against New Orleans where he's shooting, you know, four for five from three. It, it's by getting downhill. It's by using his leverage and his ability to seal off defenders at the rim. It's by doing things that he can consistently do at his size. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm i bought into it, too. Um, and I think this was after the Boston game. Mark was just saying, like, obviously, they were the, the, the fourth quarter happened fast. But the consistent thing that went for them, in the, and, and the, their third quarter then was consistent with, um, you know, the third quarter in the Indiana game, just in terms of they kind of were able to stay in it because of free throws, because of, you know, attacking the room. The intensity that they wanted to bottle up, Josh had showed that all night in the, in the Boston game, um, the triple doubles are adding up, like just the way he's putting his head down looks different. Obviously, the shots going in makes it look different, but you got to think of the, the angles he's taking to get there, the, the the verve he has in the drives. Like this is a different, I think, energy than, than he had earlier in the season. The push shots no longer look wacky. They look like they're supposed to supposed to happen. And they're happening less, I think, from the eye test. They're happening less. I think he's genuinely getting to the rim, having reverse finishes, which was like, that was not a thing to start the season. He was not, he was not having reverse layups and stuff like that. So the way he's getting to the rim, the the way he's using the rim to his advantage, the stuff like that, like kind of like you mentioned, um, I'm, I'm bought into this version too. And then a, a couple more things from the, the Philly game. I would know it was I was kind of surprised with the way it unraveled in those final five minutes, just based on what the game looked like for the first 43 minutes. Um, but at the same time, like I did think I th I thought you saw the the fruits of the labor, you know, down the road in the trip like the that look that Isaiah Joe got. Well, they got three looks at the end of that for the game. But the first look Isaiah Joe got, which was by design, a ghost screen slipped out of that, got a got an open look, I think, at the left wing. They were they essentially, you know, ran the same thing at the end of the Charlotte game, and he he hit that shot for for the lead, which effectively won the game. And so, um, I thought you could see the fruits of the labor then and there. So um, it, it wasn't a complete um, lose lose trip. And when you look at it with the grain of salt, because you know the guys that were missing, I thought it was a fine trip for them. Yeah, and that's exactly right. I think that that the book in the Philadelphia and Charlotte showed that like. Without Shane Jada against Charlotte, Isaiah Joe had two cracks at a three-pointer and yet a clean look to, to Jay Will for a three-pointer as well. You needed one of those to fall to go to overtime and then possibly win. Isaiah Joe misses two times. One of them is an air ball, and, and then Jay Will uh, has his rim out. Like, all, if you tell me that without Shane Jada, like you're going to have a chance of, of, of three wide-open threes from those three guys, okay, I'll, I'll take that because against Charlotte it works. Uh, so I'm not going to judge them too harshly because Isaiah Joe three rimmed out against, against Philadelphia uh, who were getting calls down the stretch and being at eight fourth quarter free throws. Like they were just, uh, you know, more in position to close out that game. And so I think that you saw them keep plugging away and eventually they were able to beat uh, Charlotte to kind of salvage the road trip. If you want to call it that and head back home. Now this is the final homestand of the regular season, but not the final game uh, for them at home this year, because they're going to be hosting the first round of the playoffs at least uh, so that they are at least going to be a top four seed. We're going to get into the standings 
coming up, but just as a quick overarching, your favorite part of the game, the ethos of the game, Joel, what does it mean for this team to be hosting a playoff series? It means everything. I thought I thought Josh was the most introspective after the New York game because that was when they kind of clinched the the whole uh, playoff spot. And so uh, Josh was. I mean, Josh was here uh, for the whole. I mean, they've they, they've mentioned this at times, and, and and Mark has said like the mark of great teams is like you know the guys that that are there. Um, they take a certain level of of ownership over the team. They have a certain level of autonomy that just the the, a, a reach that the coaches and, and executives just don't have over the team. And I think the guys that really have that, I mean, Dub and Chet have a, a uncommon level of that because they've only been around since last year. Um, but they still have a level of that. But like Shea, Josh, Lou, those guys really have that because they were here when this thing wasn't this, right? Bef- before the – the the twenty three wins became a thing. Well, I guess Josh was a product of you know the rebuilding, but but Shea and Lou especially um, were here before this was this. Josh experienced it, you know, losing by seventy. He was around for stuff like that, and now to be here um, to to be able to host. I mean, I th- I think it's a it's just they they could could talk about what it means more themselves, but it's just it's heavy, man. It's just a it's a it's a crazy credit to the organization and just uh, the, I mean, obviously that takes some luck to, to, we talk about this all the time to, to get Dub and Chet in the same draft, but the way the dominoes have fell, um, I think they were really, 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 really lucky to get Jalen Williams. I've been, I mean, I think everybody's high on him nowadays, but that dude is like a genuine two way star that, that, that changed their entire situation. And so, um, to be hosting now, like that's a product of, of that. That's a product of you know betting on Jalen Williams, lucking into him being a, a stud. It, it means everything. And, and in terms of like advantage, um, I I wasn't around for like the the whole the the twenty tens to see what the atmosphere here was, but I imagine um, it'll be the same way this time around. Um, which I think you could speak to that more than I can. It's it's a big deal. I mean. People like to call the, the bubble ring a, a Mickey ring because stuff like that, you know, you couldn't have stuff like that. Yeah, I think that as long as they can recapture what they were able to get, and I don't know if they will be able to. I, I hope that they'll be able to. I think that it'll be great if uh, next Sunday or Saturday the, the Paycom Center is rocking. But it was the best home court advantage in sports uh, back then. I mean, it was it was the Thunder. It was Oracle. It was those kind of arenas where it really did feel like a college uh, game. Uh, at the NBA level, and it helped the Thunder, or the players said it helped the Thunder uh, at the time. But uh, I think that this team, what's interesting is, is talking to Cam Woods, the G League head coach who was on Mark's first G League team, and they were not very good. They did not win games. They started like 0 for 6. Uh, and Cam said that the reason why that he bought into to Mark, because you got to remember, Mark's even younger at that time, his first G League team. He's even younger. Uh, he's never played the game at a high level. He's uh, just been been handed this G League job after after working as a, as a manager and as a GA for Billy Donovan uh, in Florida. And yet he gets this job. You're coming off of playing for guys like Brad Stevens at Butler, who has all the pedigree, uh, Holtman and, and all these guys. And yet you're buying into to this guy. Why did you buy into him? And he mentioned his consistent approach, win or lose, of that the same way that he acted after a win, the same way that he acted whenever the team got uh, in a better position record-wise, was the same way he was acting whenever they were 0-6. And I think that you can see that translate to his NBA career. Like Whenever the team was a 22-win team and the team was a 24-win team, they were still a very disciplined team. They were still a team that was going to make your life hard defensively. They were still a team that every single night you had to take them seriously. Now, you take them seriously – and if you do, you can outmuscle and, and outbeat Moses Brown and Isaiah Roby and those guys. But like you still had to show up every night. You could not just walk in and, and get a win against Oklahoma City, despite the fact they only won 24 times. Uh, they still were a very competitive bunch, and they had the same sort of uh, you know resolve and the same sort of philosophies that this team has. Only this team now has better players on it. And so I think that the, the building upon uh, consistency and the, and the stacking upon just uh, rooted ideas of what this team was, even back when they're losing by 70 points, 
uh, to now has been the most interesting part to see. This was not like done on the fly. This was not just done through free agency or through any other means. It was done by uh, a large part of this roster grinding it out, like Kenrich Williams, uh, you know, who was a throw into the Stephen Adams trade, and nobody thought would even break camp. They thought that they'd bring TJ Leaf in over him, uh, and he survives that. He he comes out on the other side as one of the most important veterans on this roster. Uh, so I think that it's really interesting to see that they've now kind of gone through it and, and is podcasting every single day about a 22 win team. Uh, it's been awesome to see that same team turn into a 50 plus win team. Speaking of coming up, we're going to talk about the NBA standings and try to predict how things will shake out. But first, one say right now, a butter good friends over at game time, who I think you absolutely have to use game time tonight and throughout the rest of the regular season and beyond, because as we're about to talk about, Joel, you never know who's going to play in these NBA games, what these games mean for each team, which stars are in, which stars are out, who has their seeds locked up, who's vying for actually a lower seed than they, than they actually could obtain. And so with that comes game time because game time is the app to purchase tickets at the very last minute. So you can wait it out until we tweet out who's in, who's out of the lineup uh, and then buy your tickets because with the last minute deals, uh, you can save up to 60% uh, buying last minute tickets to sports concerts, comedy theater, and all the fun stuff. They have flash deals as well to save you even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. Uh, and they even have all in pricing. You can get the total upfront with no surprise fees at checkout. You get a view from your seat, uh, which is going to give you the exact layout of the arena and of your angles and sight lines from your seat. The lowest price guaranteed or game time will credit you up to 110% of the difference. They will credit you 110% of the difference uh, if you somehow find a lower ticket, which you will not. Uh, Game time uh, ticket coverage, if you purchase it, it's covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticket industry. So go there right now, take the guesswork out of buying tickets at game time, download the game time app, create your account and use code locked in NBA for $20 off your first purchase. That's code locked in NBA, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A for 20 per- $20, $20 off of your first purchase. Uh, go there right now by downloading the game time app. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast and the Lockdown Podcast Network. Joel, the standings are up in the air and the Thunder are still only a game away from the one seed with the fact that the Nuggets and the Timberwolves have to play each other on Wednesday and you have the tiebreaker over Denver. So it's interesting to see where they can land in the standings. There, there are three games up on LA and we both don't think that uh, the Clippers will catch the Thunder, uh, but they have secured home court advantage. But the the standing shuffle goes all the way down to the play-in tournament because the the Mavericks right now uh, sit two games back from the Clippers. They sit two games ahead of Phoenix and they seem fairly comfortable at five, but then you have Phoenix and uh, New Orleans, both uh, with the identical record. You have Sacramento a game away from six or a half game away from nine. Uh, So like you just don't know how this is all going to shake out. What is your best guess for the Thunders playoff matchup? It's hard to say um, because the, it is that the, I'm I'm less I'm watching less three through five and I'm watching more obviously six through six through ten. I mean, obviously, uh, like a certain bit of that, I think the Thunder can worry us about like whoever. I, th- I I mean, we're looking at the six C, right? And so that, that's that's the most confusing thing because I mean. I, I don't remember what game that was. I think that was in Boston. Phoenix went to that game into that game with the the Cavs as the eighth seed, I think, and they came out of it the sixth seed. It's just too tight of a race to to be like, oh yeah, they could play whoever. Like we talked about earlier, the the last game or two, like depending on who these guys are playing, um, these teams could be resting or they could be playing a, a developmental team could be playing their guys with nothing to lose. Like it's just so many. I don't think I've ever – I can't remember the last time a, a final four or three games, like, mattered this much across the entire playoff picture. Like, it, it's really it's really heavy across the – almost the whole – I'd say for everybody. But, no, I mean, even the, the one seed is, like, you have to pay attention to that. I, it just matters so much. There's so many implications. If I had to guess, though um, – I, I think they end up playing the Pelicans, man, to be honest. 
The Pelicans would be, I think, one of the more interesting basketball matchups for the Thunder. Uh, early, early gut check if they do play the Pelicans. I feel uh, surprisingly good about that matchup just because we, we've seen Josh Giddy play exceptionally well in New Orleans. Uh, we've seen that the Thunder can counter Valanciunas uh, despite him having the sheer size on the Thunder. He can't defend Chet outside. If if Giddy's playing him off the floor without Giddy's playing offensively, then he's relatively useless. And if you want to dump the ball into him and uh, just keep feeding him down low, sure, you can give him two points. It's like bunting in baseball. That like, we'll, we'll absolutely take you throwing it to Valanciunas for the sake of it not being in Zion's hands, it not being in Ingram's hands, it not being in McCollum's hands. Uh, so I think that the Pelicans uh, are a good matchup for the Thunder. No, I, I, I agree. I think uh, I don't think they would lose, you know, sleep necessarily over a series with the Suns either. I mean, and that's just been, like, I think that would be a good matchup too. Um, there are obviously some obvious storylines there. But I, I I think why, like, I wouldn't be concerned about them in a series there is, I mean, the last time they played in that in the dub-led offense, like, Vogel was just defeated after that game. Basically, riding you know, like stuff you would never hear from from Dagnall, just rattling off saying like we're not athletic, we're old, we we don't play defense. Basically, all these in your windows like yeah, he, his team isn't looking like what he thought it would. And obviously, they've had problems all year with um, depth compared to other contenders per se, um, just other playoff teams. Um, that was something they knew. I think going into the whole KD thing. Um, and I don't want to say it's catching up to them, but I, I think they're starting to see maybe a ceiling of it all and what it would take to to win, not just a playoff series, but multiple. Um, and to while, you know, game planning on a game by game basis, like how much they'd really have to heighten um, their playoff performances, which don't get me wrong. They have a couple of great, a few great. I mean, I don't want to discount Bradley Beal's playoff career. He hasn't been there in so long that it's hard to. It's hard to remember what he was, but they did. They had good runs in, in Washington all those years ago. But they, they got playoff runs. They had, had fine runs. runs. They, they had, had good fine runs. runs in Washington. Good runs. Good runs. Uh, but but they had playoff performance. I don't know. I, I mean, Katie's obviously not who he was. D. Book had a great postseason last year. Was one of the the best postseason players there was. I think. Um, but the version of D. Book then isn't isn't the version we've seen as of late, right? Like we thought he was an improved defender. Um, there was just so much that came out of that that series uh, that I just don't see now. So I wouldn't be worried about the Thunder there. I, I think there are more wrinkles to the Pelican series just in terms of the, the front court, the amount of guys they can throw at Shea and Dub um, that are like all similar um, either body types or skill sets. On top of, I don't think Brandon Ingram played in the game that, you know, the last time they were in New Orleans, Zion the other day hit two pull-ups. I don't know if that's a real thing or not, but it's it's something to monitor. Um, they have answers. They have, you know, I, I know CJ's not who he was, but he spazzed in that third quarter to to help them come back. Like they they have wrinkles, man. It, it would be it would be interesting for sure. I I thought um, I've I've thought since like the middle point of the year, like I think New Orleans is a sleeper depending on the matchup to maybe not go on some crazy run, but like win a playoff series. I just don't know if I would lean them against the Thunder. I don't think that's one of those matchups. Yeah, I, I would I would lean the Thunder in that matchup. Obviously you've got to deal with Herb Jones, who's been, you know, consistently the best defender in handling Shea the last couple of years. But uh, I think overall in the series, I would lean Oklahoma City. Joel, what is your opinion right now this is going to put you on the hot seat so you got to be really good when am i at... never not on the hot seat anyway uh you're gonna be really good at, at nailing just your gut opinion sure how far without knowing the playoff matchups how far is your gut telling you that this thunder team gets yeah late second round um, like a deep second round series is what i've been saying all year i do think based on certain matchups just how they're rolling it's hard to say because we have, we've never – we don't have versions of this team playoff-wise to go off of. It's not like we say, oh, the Clippers is here, look, so-and-so. Like, we have – if the if the, if the Clippers end up playing the Mavs, like, you could have – you could make a, a well-informed guess of how that will go. I think Luka is going to crush them. Um, just because they have that history, Luka with worse teams has really 
handed it to them time and time again. And so you can make a well-informed guess there, right? We don't know what this team is going to look like at all in the postseason. So, um, But if I had to make a blind guess, like I think they push a really good team to six or seven games in the second round. Now, are there realities where they can, you know, end up rolling into a conference finals appearance? I think so. I think that's where the, the journey would end if, if there are realities like that. But uh, I think most realities, like if I'm doing my Dr. Strange thing, like 14 million realities, I think like 13.5 million of them had them going late second round. So there you have it. There you have it. First series win since Kevin Durant was in town. If that were to happen, Joel, uh, thanks again for joining the show. Let them know where they can find you on Twitter and whatever. Hold else on. What, what's your take? Why, why, why you, I'm the only one that gets go to go on a hussy? Nah, <laughs> no, the tell them what you the host, think. Joel. No, yeah, I, I, I am very, very, very confident this team wins a first round series. There, there is like one matchup where I would be uh, shaky, Who's that? and the rest, though, I just think that the Lakers are a very tough matchup. Uh, I well, think that the rest well, that's not even a reality anymore. Right? They're not going to play them now. They're game away from the uh, from the one seed, Joel. You would look at this negative Nancy. This is the problem with Joel. Very negative uh, is what is what uh, he is, but. Nonetheless, the Mavericks, I think, would be a very tough playoff matchup because I do not want to see uh, Luka Doncic in any playoff series, no matter who's uh, on the team or not on the team that 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 you're coaching. You do not want to see Luka on the other side. But yeah, I feel good about the Thunder in every other aspect of, of the postseason. I think that they still would beat the Mavericks in like a seven-gamer, but it'd be very high stress, very high it'd strong. Be a it wouldn't it be, would be it, it wouldn't be worth it by the by what you the condition you'd be in the next round it wouldn't be worth it. Be I think like, since last time we talked that they were they were high on our list of teams the Thunder wouldn't want to see first round. That would just be grueling. The way they're rolling right now, we said then that they had got better at the deadline and they were like amid like a losing streak. Now they're like crushing teams. They look unreal. Their deadline moves look good. Luca like has like the world in his palms, like the stuff they're doing, you want to talk about closers. They have closers, dude. They, those dudes are like toying with the whole league. It, it, it would be very scary. Um, and it would take the best version of Thunder to, to win in seven, I think, now. Joel, thanks again for joining us. Uh, and until tomorrow, uh, be good and be good to one another. <laughs>